Hi, welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway, author of several Tudor history books, including the one that has inspired these videos, which funnily enough is called On This Day in Tudor History. Now today, where am I time traveling back to? Well, I'm going to talk about what happened on this day in Tudor history, the 18th of July, 1509. So this is just under three months after King Henry VIII, that second Tudor monarch, has come to the throne. Edmund Dudley, administrator, president of the King's Council in the reign of Henry VIII's father, King Henry VII, and speaker of the House of Commons, was convicted of treason on this day after being blamed for the oppression of the reign of his master, King Henry VII. Now, Dudley, who was the father of John Dudley, later Duke of Northumberland, and who was also the grandfather of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, that man who becomes the uh, great favourite of Queen Elizabeth I, was charged with conspiring to hold, guide and govern the king and his council and of ordering his men to assemble in London during the final days of Henry VII's life. The record of his trial and conviction by commission of Oyer and Termina uh, gives us details of the full charges laid against Dudley. It calls him a false traitor. It states that on the 22nd of April 1509 in the parish of St Swithin in the ward of Candlewick Street, Dudley falsely, feloniously and traitorously conspired, imagined and compassed how and in what manner he, with a great force of men and armed power, might hold, guide and govern the king and his council against the wishes of the king, either by himself or others, according to the will and intention of the said Edmund, and falsely and traitorously and totally deprive the king of his royal liberty, and to make and to move discords, divisions and dissensions amongst the magnates and councillors of the king and his kingdom, and that if by him the said Edmund or by others his adherents, the king and council should refuse to be held and ruled and governed in the before-mentioned manner, the completely to destroy the king and to depose, remove and deprive him from and of his royal authority." Now, it goes on to state that in order to fulfil such wicked intention, the said Edmund Dudley wrote or caused to be written diverse letters to diverse of the king's lieges, viz. one to Edward Sutton, knight, another to Francis Cheney, knight, then Esquire, a third to Edward Darrell, knight, a fourth to Thomas Turberville, a fifth to Thomas Ashbournham, Esquire, a sixth to William Scott, knight, a seventh to Henry Long, an eight to Thomas Niverston and a ninth John Mompesson, Esquire, requiring that they, with their servants and adherents and all their power arrayed in a manner of war, should come together and speedily repair to him at London and adhere to and follow his will. Furthermore, that the said Edmund, in order to carry into effect the said false and traitorous intention on the said day, delivered the letters to Richard Page and Angel Messenger to deliver the same to the said Sir Edward Sutton and the aforementioned, who delivered the same accordingly, by reason whereof a great multitude and power of people arrayed in manner of war came to London, the parish and ward aforesaid, according to the tenor of the letters against the allegiance of the said Edmund. So there's very strong language in there about Edmund Dudley and about uh, war, you know, about him uh, you know, calling on his supporters, gathering men, gathering a gathering force of arms against King Henry VII, falsely and traitorously into, you know, take control of the kingdom. Now, although Dudley pleaded not guilty to the charges, and I would kind of agree with him there, the commission found him guilty and he was sentenced to death. 
His colleague, Sir Richard Empson, who'd also been one of King Henry VII's chief advisers, was also convicted of treason. And these two men who had you know, been these... Uh, the, the, the kind of Cromwell uh, kind of figure to Henry the Seventh, you know, like Cromwell was with uh, Henry the Eighth, like Sir Thomas More was with Henry the Eighth. These two men served uh, Henry the Seventh very closely and very loyally, and they were ended up in Henry the Eighth's reign being thrown into the Tower of London to await their deaths. They were then beheaded on Tower Hill on the seventeenth of August, fifteen o nine. Now, historians have seen these men as scapegoats for Henry VII's unpopular regime and um, have attributed, have attributed sorry, their fall um, in 1509 to Henry's desire to win popularity and signify his distancing himself from his father's draconian financial measures. So some historians see that because... Ed, Edmund Dudley and Richard Emerson certainly don't seem to have tried to, uh, you know, do a coup against the, the government. So they were just being, uh, you know, seen as scapegoats for Henry VII's unpopular, you know, taxation and, you know, Henry VIII coming to the throne and wanting a kind of a new start. But historian Derek Wilson in his book, and I'd recommend this book, it's fabulous reading, In the Lion's Court, um, he writes of there being more to the falls of these two men than that. He writes, The king certainly had these motives, but they do not fully explain the significance which the fate of the two ministers held for some of those most closely involved. There was a very pointed message in the precise words of the indictment to govern the king and his council against the wishes of the king. The very first power Henry VIII had displayed was the power to destroy highly placed servants who failed to do his bidding. It was a power he would exercise frequently and to devastating effect in the years ahead. So this was a very clear warning from the new king, Henry VIII, who at this time was you know, only a young man. When he inherited the throne in April 1509, he was only 17. And this is a clear warning to those around him on the royal council who have risen and are favourites. Um, it's a warning to those who might look to control or to try and manipulate him. Emerson's biographer, M.M. M. Condon, uh, comments that ruthless though he was, Empson acted by the king's command and was occasionally subject to his check. And Dudley's biographer, Stephen Gunn, writes that Dudley was made a convenient scapegoat for Henry the Hen sorry, for Henry VII's exactions, and that certainly he'd exploited his position as the king's executive but so to a less extreme degree had most of Henry's other councillors. There are many signs that the general shape of policy was the king's. So these two men were simply being good servants of the king. They were doing the king's bidding, like Thomas Cromwell in Henry VIII's reign. And really, they were used as scapegoats for just a king that wanted to come to the throne and show the country of England, show the people of England that he was different to his father and this was a whole fresh start. It is so sad that two men had to suffer uh, as a point, uh, as an example. Uh, very sad indeed. Sorry to leave you on such a gloomy note, but I will be back tomorrow. Um, I apologise for the lack of comments and interactions over the past uh, 10 days or so. I've been away on the executed uh, Queen's Torch. I'm sure I will do a video on at some point uh, to share with you my experiences there. But uh, I was uh, very busy on that, uh, leading, um, co-leading a group with my dear friend Philippa, which and it was a brilliant. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. You can subscribe by clicking round about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as well. And please do give this video a like if you've enjoyed it. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.